Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Nancy Wenjanak, the Director of the Mycology and Mycobacteriology Laboratories. Dr. Wenjanak, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me. So now we've been seeing Candida auris, this fungus in the news recently, specifically that it's been identified in two healthcare facilities in Texas and one in Washington, DC. So maybe we could start with some basics on what exactly Candida auris is. Sure, absolutely. And as you mentioned, Bobby, Candida auris is a fungus and specifically it's a yeast. So there are many different types of yeast and candida species are among the most common yeast that we see making up part of our normal human microbiota. We find them in our skin, in the mouth, in our GI tract, in the vagina. And candida species can cause disease in humans, most commonly things like skin infections, diaper rash, and vaginitis. However, in a person with an immunocompromising condition, candida species, including candida auris, can sometimes cause fungemia, which is just a fancy term we use for a fungus in the blood. And this can actually be quite serious and is often associated with high morbidity and mortality. So Candida auris was first recognized in 2009 when it was recovered from the ear of a patient in Asia. But since that time, this new species has spread rapidly around the world, and it now has been reported to cause disease in patients in dozens of countries around the world, including the United States. Canada auris presents in humans in a couple of ways. It can cause frank disease, such as a bloodstream infection or a wound infection, or it can be found in patients without signs or symptoms of disease, where these patients are simply referred to as colonized with Canada auris. Patients who are at a higher risk for Canada auris infection or for asymptomatic colonization are those who have received health care in long-term care facilities, such as nursing homes, those who have been recently hospitalized outside of the United States in countries with known Canada auris cases, as well as patients who are infected or colonized with carbapenemase producing bacteria. So we're particularly concerned about Canada auris as a pathogen for a few reasons. First of all, it's often multidrug resistant with about 85% of isolates showing resistance to the azole class of antifungals, about a third of the isolates showing resistance to amphotericin B, and a few percent, maybe one to 2%, showing resistance to the other major class of antifungals, which are called the echinocandids. So this makes treatment of candida auris infection very challenging. And as a result, the 30-day mortality for patients with a candida auris infection is around 30%, which is quite high. Another reason that Canada auris is uh, challenging as an emerging pathogen is because it's difficult to identify using standard laboratory methods. And as such, it can be misidentified as other Canada species, and this can lead to delayed or inappropriate treatment. And then finally, as you mentioned, Bobby, early, Canada auris has caused outbreaks in healthcare facilities like those that were reported in the news recently in Texas, where there were 22 clinical and colonized cases, and Washington, D.C., where there were 101 clinical and colonized cases. Some of the cases in Texas and Washington were reported to be pan-resistant or echinocannon-resistant isolates, making them particularly concerning because these cases are very difficult to treat. And finally, Canada auris is, is challenging for physicians and healthcare facilities because it can be spread through contact with contaminated environmental surfaces or contaminated equipment, or even from person to person spread through contact. Canada auris can survive in the environment for long periods of time, and it can withstand some of the commonly used disinfectants that we have in healthcare settings, making it more challenging to eradicate than several other pathogens. So this is another instance where good hand hygiene is critical, as is the frequent cleaning of potentially contaminated surfaces with bleach or other agents that are active against Canada auris. Well, thank you, Nancy. Wow, that's a lot to uh, take in and several reasons, it sounds like, for us to be concerned. Uh, let's talk about infection with Canada <laughs> auris. How do people usually present with Canada auris infection? Well, the folks that usually present with a candida auris infection are those who are most commonly have been in the healthcare setting for a very long time. So as we said before, if they're in long-term care facilities or perhaps in the intensive care unit where they've had a large number of healthcare encounters over days or weeks or even months, 
as mentioned, it most commonly presents as a bloodstream infection or as a wound infection. And the common symptoms are fever and chills that don't improve after a, a normal course of antibiotic therapy. So when you're treating for a suspected bacterial infection and they don't get better for a long period of time, people start to think about fungal infections like Candida auris infection. It's also been found in respiratory specimens in urine, but the significance of finding Candida auris in these specimens is not clear at this time. And as we've already discussed, people can be asymptomatically colonized with Candida auris, which creates a risk for passing the organism on to more susceptible hosts, especially in a healthcare setting. Okay, so it sounds like you can be asymptomatically colonized, but also if you have certain risk uh, factors, if you're in a healthcare setting for a very long time, you can actually get frank infection, and then those can be really hard to treat. So I guess what our, our listeners are probably asking themselves now is, should we all be worried? And uh, if so, why and how much? Well, I don't know about worried, but um, concerned, anyhow, maybe. Okay. Candidorus hasn't been reported to cause community-inquired infections yet, so it probably shouldn't keep the average healthy person awake at night, but it is a concern in our healthcare settings where the patients who are most vulnerable to a Candidorus infection can be found. The recent healthcare-associated outbreaks in Texas and Washington are concerning and should be a good reminder to all institutions to be vigilant in their surveillance screening for Candidorus colonization. Susceptible hosts include immunocompromised patients, especially those with a lot of intravenous lines, which provide a potential portal of entry for the fungus to the bloodstream. And the ongoing COVID pandemic has really strained our healthcare resources. And as a result, we're seeing more opportunistic fungi such as Canada auris, or you may have heard recently also about the black fungus, also known as the mucoralis, uh, causing outbreaks in India in patients with COVID. So COVID causes our patients to be very sick and these fungi such as Canada auris and the mucoralis really take advantage of this uh, to cause additional uh, concerns in patients. Okay. Well, th that makes sense, Nancy, and, and definitely something we'll be keeping an eye on then and maybe have you back sometime in the future to give us an update. Uh, for now, uh, presumably we have ways of detecting this. What type of laboratory testing is performed specifically to detect Canada auris, and can we detect it in your lab here at Mayo Clinic? Yes, actually. So that is the good news. We've probably made the most progress in studying Canada auris in laboratory detection and identification over the last couple of years. Canada auris colonization or asymptomatic carriage is typically tested for using a surveillance swab um, done on high-risk patients. Usually it's a combination axilla groin swab, which is either cultured to specialize agar in the laboratory or tested using a Canada auris specific PCR assay. In our laboratory, we've developed and implemented a Canada or a specific real-time PCR assay that we can use to rapidly detect and identify Canada or directly from these surveillance swabs and from blood uh, if necessary. Canada auris infection can also be uh, detected using a standard fungal blood culture or a wound culture that we see in many laboratories. There are no phenotypic characteristics that will allow a lab tech to differentiate Canada auris from other Canada species. In the early days, right after Canada auris was recognized as an emerging pathogen, some older laboratory tests and some automated systems have difficulty differentiating Canada auris from other closely related Canada species, such as Canada hemiloniae. And this led to inappropriate treatment, or it could lead to a delay in the uh, initiation of appropriate infection control precautions. Thankfully, recent laboratory advances particularly in genotypic methods have made accurate identification possible. Isolates grown in culture in the laboratory on, on agar plates can be identified using Multitoff mass spectrometry or Sanger sequencing using targets such as the D1, D2 region of the 28S ribosomal DNA or the ITS region of ribosomal DNA. In the past, it wasn't common for labs to identify Canada to the species level when recovered from non-sterile sites such as sputum, but now the CDC is recommending that it becomes routine laboratory practice in order to help identify potential cases of Canada auris or those colonized with Canada auris. Thanks, Nancy. So uh, for our listeners who may not be familiar with some of these terms, it just I'll briefly uh, summarize then. So the phenotypic characteristics, basically what the organism looks like, aren't sufficient for us to tell um, Candida auris apart from some of the other species that can look just like it. So that we're going to either protein detection methods or molecular methods, is that correct? 
Correct. That's absolutely correct. So we have a PCR here. People are using sequencing and maybe some of the multi-top mass spec tests as well can differentiate and uh, definitively identify Candida auris. Correct. A lot of the multi-TOF libraries have really been improved over the last couple of years to be able to differentiate Canada Oris and sequencing libraries as well. So both of those molecular methods uh, work very well. So. Okay, so good news for us that we can detect it, uh, accurately identify it, and then hopefully the patients can get uh, appropriate treatment. So as far as testing goes, is there a role for environmental testing? We've talked about screening patients and detecting patients with active disease, but what about just testing the environment to see if it's present? Yeah, that's a good question. It has been done in the past. It's not really thought that at this point in time, testing of environmental surfaces for Canada Aura should be routine, and it's not recommended by the CDC. Instead, they recommend that resources are focused on screening of patients for colonization, as well as on a thorough cleaning of rooms where infected or colonized patients have been housed in order to prevent transmission to others. So in general, if you've had a colonized patient in a room, you'll probably find Canada Aura's, and there's not mm -hmm. a huge role for environmental testing. Okay, good to know. Well, you've given us a lot to think about, and um, I guess I'll just uh, ask if you have any parting words or anything else that you want to share on this topic for our listeners. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. You know, we still have a lot to learn about Canada Oris. There's a lot of mysteries to unravel. Where did it originate, and why has it only appeared in recent years? Why is it able to spread so rapidly around the world? Why is it more likely to be resistant to the major classes of antifungals than other Canada species? So there's lots of research to be done yet in this area. Hospitals and healthcare workers are partnering with the CDC and other public health officials to learn how best to detect, contain, and prevent the spread of Canada auras. And the good news is, as we just talked about, laboratories now have robust methods available for the detection and accurate identification of Canada auras. And this should assist our public health colleagues with their efforts to contain the spread of this emerging global fungal pathogen. But lots more work to be done. Well, thank you, Nancy. Very interesting information. I appreciate you being with us here today. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.